Yeah, that, I didn't believe that myself. <laughs> but anyhow, we, uh, we're not, we're not going to study a book here. We're actually going to, in our adult Sunday school class, take up the, the subject of how we got our Bible. And uh, I don't know, some people I think maybe thought we were going to jump right into the history part, uh, but we actually, it, it's, we're actually going to start with some basic things uh, that will lead us into that study uh, of how we got our Bible. And uh, along the way, we are going to go not only from the biblical point of view, how we got our Bible, but we'll actually talk about if God said that he would preserve his word, then, then there has to be a way that he actually did it in history. And, uh, and, and we'll cover some of that as well. Uh, in fact, what, just to kind of let you know, uh, I put these seven words. These are, I, I kept thinking about how to tackle the subject, how to start. And, uh, and, and these are like vocabulary words that we're not just going to study a definition. I could have wrote, if I had time to finish writing on the board, I didn't prepare it ahead of time. Uh, but a definition for each one of those, a working definition for each one of those. We're actually going to study each one of those as the introduction to how we got our Bible. It's actually the seventh there when you get into the preservation. We're working our way to our Bible. When I say how we got our Bible, I'm referring to the King James Bible. Now some of you might not know that. If you're carrying a different version of the Bible, you are going to learn how you got your Bible. Uh, but it w I wouldn't necessarily line up with that and say that's how I got my Bible. Uh, you'll see there is a difference between the King James and the other versions. And, and part of getting ready to understand that is to finally get down to the very fact that there is a doctrine in your Bible called preservation. Uh, and, and therefore, just like God, when we talk about inspiration, that he gave the word comes out of the mouth of God, the words on this page are out of the mouth of God, so it is that, that God promised to preserve his word, and therefore we can expect him to do it, and if he did it, then where is it? And, and uh, ultimately, you learn to appreciate uh, the King James Bible. I think even from our introduction today, they're, they're, it's just fascinating, just looking at the words themselves, that you're going to have an appreciation for the Bible itself right from the start. Um, so the Bible, we're going to, that's going to be today's Sunday school class. We're going to start talking about the Bible, and, and really it'll go a little bit beyond that. But then once we define what we mean by the Bible, because the word Bible is not found in the Bible, <laughs> so, but we call it the Bible, and then the, the, a common term is scripture, writing, and not just anybody's writing, but the writing that, is, that would be considered God's word. And then as God gave his word and it was put in writing, there comes a, a, a time where it's canonized. That is, when we say the Bible, we're talking about 39 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books. How do we know that? How did they get in one book that we call the Bible? So we talk about canonization. That's really, when you get into the area of preservation, that's happening while God's preserving his word. But I want you to be familiar with that term, so we'll study that term. But then, then comes the process where God gives revelation to man, and that revelation becomes inspiration, which really, that inspiration is related to Scripture, because it's not just inspiration that man was inspired, man, what he wrote was inspired, which is called Scripture, so inspiration. And then illumination, that's when you start studying the Bible, and what God had put down in a page becomes uh, a reality in your life, becomes an understanding in your heart. Uh, there is illumination in the scripture. That will take the, the word of God and the Holy Spirit in your life. And then, then as you have God working in the lives of people, then you're going to start seeing the process of preservation take place. So you can see that, as I thought about it, these, if we get familiar with these words, then it leads us right into uh, getting to study preservation. Now, Take your Bible, and, and just, just to get us started, go to, get two books, get Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And then the other one, get uh, John chapter 21, actually 20 and 21. I just started looking at these terms 
And everything we're, we're going to launch from the Bible, so we're going to be in the scriptures for a while. Oh, what I started to say to you too, is, is not only are we going to study these terms, when we get to preservation, I had some time ago, and I've told you this already, asked uh, Lawrence Valley, who's been studying in depth about some of the, the men that God used to give us the Bible that we have. And, uh, and he is so uh, in depth on studying William Tyndale that he can't broaden his study beyond that and he, he won't stop studying that. You can tell from Lawrence when he plays the guitar up here that he's a perfectionist. And he doesn't just do something part way. <laughs> It, it, anyhow, so he, is, he has been for months, and even before I even asked him to do this, I asked him to do it because I knew he was already doing it, we, just in discussion, uh, studying some of these men. He's bought several books and gone through tons of books about these men that God used in history. So I thought, wow, he's going to be more thorough than I am, and he's certainly going to understand more of this than I am. Rather, I can name you the men and, and a little bit about their life, but uh, it's going to be work, and it's just going to be quoting out of history books. Lawrence is absorbing this information. He, he sat down on a Wednesday and started talking, and more than one Wednesday, and just, just throwing dates and names. And it, it was like sitting down, talking to your grandfather, listening to him tell you a story. Anyhow, I put the pressure on him <laughs> to say, look, when we get the history here, I want you to teach that. Well, he's overcome by that. And uh, so we have agreed that what he is going to do is only cover William Tyndale. That's his hero. And, and also, I, see, he, I told him about this when we're studying the book of Mark. So he's, he's ready to go. And I'm not going to wait till I get to this point to turn him loose. When he tells me he's ready, even as early as next week, I'm going to turn him loose because the data you need to know it doesn't matter when you learn about William Tyndale, you're going to eventually learn how, he, how important he was to the process of getting your Bible. And, and he's already studied it up. He's got it burning inside of him. And I'm ready to sit down and listen to him myself. And uh, so as soon as he tells me that he's ready, we're not waiting until we get down here before I present him as. And, and he'll take one, two, three, whatever Sunday school classes he needs to, to go through the life of William Tyndale and... and, and, and share with us the things that he's learned, because he's learned an awful lot. So uh, understand that's how it's going to happen. So we might not even finish studying the Bible before you're going to learn about William Tyndale. And, and I'm anxious for that myself. Now, when we talk about the Bible, the Bible actually, that's a term that we actually get from the Greek. Uh, in the Bible, that you're going to see that the word shows up. And in the Greek, it's biblion. So we get the, I guess even from the Latin, you get the word Bible. And it just simply means books, and it's plural. Um, we use it as Bible, the book. But, because, but what we're referring to when we refer to the Bible, we are referring to the books. We're referring to 20, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament books of the Bible. And, uh, and so the, that's how we end up using the term and referring to God's Word as the Bible. And, uh, and the very fact that those 30, 20, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament found their way in the canon of Scripture, that's how you realize that you're going to get Scripture. Yep. Just a little memory trick for people, because I used to have a hard time remembering, you know, the 39 and 27. Nine times three is 27. So ah. 39, three times nine is 27. Oh. So 39 and 27. Thirty-nine is twenty-seven. Remember that. <laughs> okay, very good. So anyhow, that's how we get the term Bible. But I, as I said, it means books, and the Bible does talk about books. First of all, it talks about books in the in the singular sense. It's used eight times in the Bible. And what's unique about this is I just started looking how the Bible uses the terms. These terms that we're going to be talking about, and and as soon as you start looking at the verses, you go, "Wow, they're they're lessons." I mean, you don't have to go out and try to find an outline to teach. Just if you stop and, and consider the words that are being said, uh, they're powerful. I told you Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Now, by the way, when, when I say that the Bible speaks about books in, in a plural form, it's used about eight, it's used eight times. But th those eight times are not always referring to what we call the Bible, God's Word. They can be books of history, books of men, uh, 
heavenly books. Uh, the angels talk about, the, that came to Daniel, talked about the, the, the books in the heavens. And then, uh, which is certainly pro probably the Bible that we have down here. Uh, and then the, uh, the book that we would call the Bible, God's Word. But you can see how it's used in a general sense right here in Ecclesiastes 12. As Solomon, he's actually writing one of the books of the Bible. And, and when he does, he, 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 he concludes in verse 12 of chapter 12 saying, And further, by these my son be admonished, by the things that he had wrote, of the making of many books there is no end, and much study is weariness to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So a real good conclusion to the book of Ecclesiastes, and although Solomon is referring to books that could be written, he's not necessarily talking about uh, the books of the Bible, he, because God will have a completion of those. Uh, although even John, the verse we're going to read there in John, John agrees that more could be written about Jesus Christ. But, but there's a reference to books and, and that these are written, the things that are here are written to teach uh, generations beyond Solomon uh, to fear God. Now look over in John. And stop in verse 20 before I read the passage out of chapter 21. John chapter 20, and verse 30 and 31, John is almost done with the book, and then he writes one more chapter, but he says in chapter 20, verse 30, it says, And many signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So it, we're, we're eventually going to study that word book, even later on, not right away here, uh, but how unique that, that word book is in the Bible itself. John is writing, and he's calling what he's writing a book, and that Jesus did other things, but these are written for a perp the reason, he picked the certain things that he did write about that the, that the saints there, the, the kingdom saints, the Jews, would believe that Jesus is the Christ. When he concludes in chapter 21, he says in verse 25, he says, And there are, also, there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So uh, yeah, you start valuing that God was able to take infinite knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and do it in the 66 books of the Bible. John said if, if all things could be written, the world wouldn't hold them. And that's true. Don't you have all kinds of other questions? But the Bible has enough answers in it that God could contain, take all his infinite w wisdom, knowledge that he would have for us, and he limited it to just 66 books, making up our Bible. And there could be more but don't need more because God is able to condense that information down here. That tells you how valuable the Bible is that we have. Uh, and then concerning the, that book, one more verse on that. Come over to 2 Timothy chapter 4, a statement that the Apostle Paul makes. It, it, the Apostle Paul, his last book that he wrote, says in verse 13, well, I guess I read verse, no, just verse 13 is okay. He, he's writing to Timothy, and Timothy's supposed to come, and when he comes, he's supposed to bring some things. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee. So Paul's in a dungeon, <laughs> and he wants a jacket. He's cold. And uh, so when Timothy comes there, he says that that cloak bring with him. And he says, and the books, but especially the parchments. 
Now, there's a lot of controversy over what Paul's talking about here. I remember one preacher one time talking about the importance of other books other than the Bible. And he referred to the parchments as the Bible, and that's why it says especially the parchments, but that Paul liked other books too. And uh, I don't know if that's true. I choose not to believe that. <laughs> when I look at that verse, you know what I think it's talking about? I think the Old Testament is called the books. The New Testament are the parchments. They are started to write on vellum, I think it's called, uh, uh, skins of animals. And the New Testament is, on, is written and preserved in a different manner than the Old Testament was. And I, I think the Apostle Paul, when he's uh, talking about it, he's talking about the books referring to the Old Testament, and especially the parchments, that, that, would even, that would be his epistles already. Especially when you get into the area of canon, there's something that's already, there's a group of writings, scrolls, uh, that he is asking for that uh, I know, but when we start studying that canon, that, that Peter already has a copy of Paul's writings. And, uh, and that's real important doctrine to get. But, but here, Paul at the end of his life, look, look, at, look at chapter 4 and verse uh, uh, 7. Well, verse 6. I am now ready, now catch that, now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. So Paul's going to die, right? So bring, bring the coat, bring the books, especially the parchments. He's facing death. He's going to study the Bible till the day he dies. Perhaps even, well, of course, he's writing 2 Timothy, so they can't, if Timothy can't bring that, that's, he, that's what he's writing to them, writing him to do. So, uh, but anyhow, that shows you the importance of the Bible and also the very fact of uh, some of the idea of canonizing and even preservation from the beginning. So anyhow, the, that, that's books plural, that just a couple samples of, of those. The word book by itself, the one I said we're going to study in more detail later on, it's used 188 times in a variety of ways, but at the same time, sometimes in a very particular way. And you've already seen some of that particular. But what, look at what's interesting here. Look at the first time the word book is found in your Bible and the last time. So you get Genesis 5, Revelation chapter 22. Genesis 5, actually I could have just read that to you. It's a, it's a simple verse, but it just shows right from the beginning the use of this. It says, This is the book of the generation of Adam in the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. So you start out in the book of Genesis just after the creation and the fall of man and, and the, the fact Cain kills Abel here. Then you get to chapter 5 and this is the book of the generations of Adam. And it starts out, by the way, maybe I should show the other verse. Did you ever read Matthew chapter 1? If, you, if you're fast, you can turn there, otherwise I'll read it to you. That's, that's the beginning of your Old Testament. The beginning of the New Testament starts out this way. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Wow. You see the uniqueness of the Bible? It starts out immediately telling you that the Bible is a book. And it starts out with the beginning of man. And then right, leads right up when you get to what we call the New Testament. Now you got the generations of Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind. And then it ends with Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22, a passage you, sh you will be familiar with <laughs> as we study preservation. But again, we're looking at it for the sake of talking about book singular. It says in verse 18, it says, I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, that if any man shall add unto the things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of, book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Well, not only is Revelation can call itself a book, but it's really the conclusion of the book, the Bible, with the warning there of how important the things are that are in there. 
There is everything in the Bible belongs there, and nothing need, nothing should be left out. Amen. And Anybody who would try to add to the Bible, there's certainly a warning against them. It just tells you that the Bible's a closed, contained book. That's why I say that's a verse that's going to teach you preservation from the beginning, at least in the sense that God in, in, uh, designed to have, give us a book that's going to fully contain everything we need. Man can't add to it, and man better not take anything from it. So God's got this book, and, and you see the appreciation for the book that we call the Bible. Now, I said the, the Bible does it, the word Bible is not in the Bible. It, the word book is, and that's where we get that from. But the most, the most reference, the most biblical reference to what we call the Bible is the word of the Lord. That's used 235 times in the Bible. And that, so that becomes, when the Bible would speak of itself, it speaks of itself as the word of the Lord. And that's really uh, self-defining in this sense, that the word of the Lord, just by very expression, of course, means the exclusion of anything else, that the word of the Lord is only the declaration of what God has said. If it's the word of the Lord, it's not the word of man. <laughs> And it's not the input of man. It may, man can't, has no claim to it at all that the word of the Lord is his word. And, and that's what the Bible likes to call itself more than anything else. And, uh, and that would include the word of the Lord in the Old Testament. You'll find capital L-O-R-D, all caps, meaning the word of Jehovah God, the creator God. Well, Jehovah God, let's put it that way. And then, then when you get to the New Testament, you still got the word of the Lord, sometimes referring back to the Old Testament scriptures, but also the New Testament writers referring to Jesus Christ, calling him Lord, and the Greek, curious, L, capital L, small O-R-D, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. But all of those times is the word of the Lord. Now, the impact of the significance of that, I mean, just by the definition, tells you that you're, 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 you've got God's word. But the first usage and then the, the usage that follow. When I, when I first looked at that, I'm going to look at the first, look at the last. And then I started looking at some in between, and it, it just, it's too powerful to leave out. So start back at the first, Genesis chapter 15. That's why I say these, these become a Bible lesson in themselves, that when you're studying this book, the Bible, you are reading the word of the Lord. It's His word. And you better appreciate it that way. Um, of course, for all the reasons that the Bible tells us to, but just even looking at these will, will express it. Um, it, it. What was interesting to me is the first usage of the word of the Lord, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. It says, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, you know why that was significant to me? You know, the, Moses actually wrote the book of Genesis. He goes back to the very beginning with Adam. But the first person to receive the word of the Lord was Abraham. Well, you know, Adam certainly did. But I mean, the first time in the Bible that you have the word of the Lord being used as an expression is, 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 an, is something that's being told that what God had promised Abraham is the word of the Lord reason that's significant is you're going to learn as we study the Bible that part of the reason of God separating out the nation of Israel is to commit unto them the oracles of God. The word was oral until the nation of Israel came along and then that's when it becomes in written form starting with Moses and, and, and that's the word of the Lord that was delivered to Abraham. He's the one who's receiving the word of the Lord that Moses is going to write down. So you see that expression, it's there again in verse 4. It says, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Which then that one verse wipes out Islam. Because that's exactly what they deny. The very, the very expression where the word of the Lord is, is what they, they, they say, no, no, the, the, that it's not, well, of course, he's referring to uh, 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 Eliezer's son, but 
but eventually Islam adopts Ishmael rather than Isaac, and that's the, the, the seed that the Lord's referring to there is Isaac. But anyhow, that, that's the first usage. Now, before we go to the last, let, let's go to the second. Watch how powerful this is. That's in Exodus, by the way. <laughs> Tell you how to go there. Exodus chapter 9. And verse 20, it says, He that feareth the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his, ser uh, made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servant and his cattle, his servants and his cattle in the field. What an interesting, I mean, I can't pass that up. You either listen to the word of the Lord and their salvation, or if you don't listen to the word of the Lord, there is death and damnation. And so the, the second expression just lays out the importance of the word of the Lord. That's not something to be ignored, it's something to be heeded. And those who don't heed the word of the Lord, there's death. And of course there's eternal death as we understand as well. Now, just follow these, just because I can't leave them off. I won't... I just can't do it. <laughs> Come over to Numbers chapter 15. It was, in verse 30 it says, But the soul that doth ought presumptuously whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Well, that's one of those expressions that when I'm teaching the subject of salvation, salvation in the Old Testament was different. Israel was God's people. They, when they're circumcised, eight days old, they're, Israel is his people. But the warning to them is that they could do things to be cut off from his people. Us Gentiles, when it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that's the age of grace. Amen. Everybody has to get saved in the age. Nobody's God's people until you get saved. Then we become uh, the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. But, okay, so you got, but my point in this verse is someone who does presumptuously, that is, whatever they think, whatever comes in their mind, they're going to, I have my own way of living. I have my own beliefs. Well, that person's not going to belong to the Lord, is it? Verse 31 says, Because he hath despised the word of the Lord, and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall, be utterly, shall, uh, shall utterly be cut off, his iniquity shall be upon him. So again, there's a warning about ignoring the word of God, but here it's someone who would take the, their own presumption, presumption and just live in their own understanding rather than go to the word of God and understand what the word of God says or the word of the Lord says, and so you see the importance of the word of the Lord. You're right here, so just flip over to chapter 22. And verse 18, I think I referred to this on Wednesday, at least to, to Balaam himself. But 22, 18 says, And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, and th this is really, when you get into understanding the word of the Lord, and how that excludes any words of man, that it is God's word itself, then you realize, if you read the context of, Gen of Numbers chapter 22, Balaam is actually being offered money by Balak to curse the nation of Israel. And he's willing to do it. God tells him, don't go with this man. And then he asks again, can I go? And then he finally goes. He's disobeying God, but he is a prophet of God. And so, if he could just let his own words come out of his mouth, he'd be a rich man. But he can't do it. And this is what he says. Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord, my God, to do less or more. Can't add my... See, he, he actually teaches Balak, eventually, how to get Israel cursed by God. But he can't curse him himself. 
he tells them, look, you know, get your people to come and, and mingle with them and have them commit some adultery and bow down to your God, and then God will curse them. And that's how, that's, that, that's what's called the, uh, the heir of Balaam uh, in, in the book of Jude and all. The, the, anyhow, he, he is actually wants to work against Israel, but he can't. As a prophet of God, every time he opened his mouth, blessing came out. The word of the Lord. He can't say, he can't add to God's word, he can't take away from God's word. God's speaking through him, and it's not his word. That's the point. It's the word of the Lord. Which then, if this Bible is the word of the Lord, how important that we take heed to every word that's written in it. Uh, so, let's do one more from the Old Testament. 1 Samuel, chapter 3. This is, we learned this in the book of Acts, maybe not from this point of view, but the thing we're about to say. 1 Samuel chapter 3, Peter in writing the book of Acts and referring to the promises God made to Israel says, Yea, from, from Samuel and those that followed after, all have likewise spoken and have told you of these things. He, he reached out and grabbed Samuel and said, All who, pro, who spoke after him have told them about the coming kingdom. Why did he grab Samuel? Well, he grabbed Samuel because Samuel comes in a day in which Israel is in decline. He, they, they, they wanted a king, and, and God's going to give them a king. The, 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 the priests were corrupt, and the king is actually the king that they chose is to be like the other nations when they weren't supposed to be. And God is going to use Samuel in a special way. Chapter 3, verse 1, it says, The child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. God had stopped talking to the nation of Israel. Just like after the book of Malachi, 400 years of silence till John the Baptist shows up. So the word of God becomes precious because they don't have God. They only have written form, what God had given them so far in the law. Now, Mo, now Samuel is going to begin what's called, the Bible's called the Law and the Prophets. So now they're going to have not just the Bible in vision and, and spoken form, they're going to have it in written form as God's going to use the prophets to write his scriptures. Uh, verse 7, it says, Now Samuel did not know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And then God begins to talk to Samuel. When it says he didn't know the Lord, it didn't, he didn't have that intimate relationship with the Lord as a prophet. And now all of a sudden, God's going to start using him as a child to start giving him revelation. God's going to speak to him, and God's, going to, uh, God's word is going to be there. And, and Samuel is important to David, to Saul, and, and, uh, because he's going to have the word of the Lord. Just, just for whether you read Elijah... Probably Elisha. I'm not exactly sure I saw the verse on that. But what's interesting is the last three books of the Old Testament, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, you don't have to go there and look at them. They all begin the same way. The word of the Lord to the prophet Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. They, they write, their writings are called the word of the Lord to them. And then they write it down. So that we're not just talking about the Bible being the word of the Lord spoken in the ears of someone that the Bible, what the, the word of the Lord is, is when he spoke to these prophets and they wrote their, the word of the Lord down, they are all declaring that what's being written is not their word, it's the word of the Lord. Man, we had one more verse. It was the last usage, but uh, I can't do it. it. But it needed to tie in. It needed, we'll, we'll tie it in whenever I get back up the pulpit, whether that's next week or the week after, but anyhow. Two bells. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I pray that just looking at these verses, just as I started putting it down in note form, realized we need to see these so that we have appreciation that you did intend to write a book that we still have today that we need to handle very carefully and realize that what we have in our hands is indeed the word of the Lord other places, the Word of God. Father, help us to not only appreciate that reverence, but to read it and to hang on to every word and to realize that if your intent was to give us a Bible, then certainly you would have preserved it and we can be confident that the book we have in our hand is your word to us. And we pray as we go on that that become more convincing to us so that we don't spend our time 
wondering what you said, but study what you have said. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.